Okay, bienvenidos. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we, we were just working through some technical issues here, um, but we're gonna get this show on the road and uh, we just wanna uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, as we near the end of Black History Month and uh, celebrate our culture and uh, you know the, the, the topic today of migrations and um, race and, and everything that comes together with Afro-Latinidad. Uh, my name is Yaosef Medina. I'm the Director of Community Initiatives at Virginia Humanities and also serve on the board of the Afro-Latino Forum. And I'm um, just glad to be here with everybody today. Um, you know, really, uh, you know, want to also acknowledge a number of the other organizations that help put this on together. And uh, so let's let's just acknowledge uh, La, La Casa de las Americas de, at La Guardia Community College, the Center for Latin American, Caribbean and Latino Studies at CUNY Grad Center, the International Society of Black Latinos, the DC Afro-Latino Caucus, the Reforma Afro-Latine Working Group, uh, the Afro-Latino Forum, and Café con Libros Bookstore. Um, this event is a celebration of three recently released books that all talk about Afro-Latinidad and migrations. We will have a conversation with Dr. Keisha Coroneldi, uh, author or, uh, of, of Panama and Black, Dr. Milagros Denis Rosario, author of Drops of Inclusivity, and Dr. Maricel Moreno, author of Crossing Waters, hosted by Manuel Mendez, president of the DC Afro-Latino Caucus. And uh, we just think that discussing migrations and Black erasure as Afro-Latines, Afro-Latinos is important because our stories are not always shared and told. And so we hope that this discussion will bring light into the migration experiences of Afro-Latinidad. And without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Juanita Palicios um, uh, Sims, president of the International Society of Black Latinos. And uh, without further ado, take it away, Juanita. Thank you, Isef. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon on the uh, west side and good evening on the uh, east side. I'm so excited for this conversation. I'm excited that of our partnerships. It is awesome to see that us Afro-Latino organizations come together for an important cause. So excited about the authors. The International Society of Black Latino was founded on 101010 to bring awareness of our Afro-Latino. And um, to get more information, just go on blacklatinos.com or .org. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Manuel, Mendes at the of the University of Maryland PhD student whose scholarship focuses on Afro-Latino history in the DC metropolitan region. A documentary producer and an archival activist, Manuel is a frequent invitee panelist and speaker on Latino identity, black culture, memory and heritage and anti-Black racial oppression among Spanish-speaking and or white supremacist communities. Manuel's scholarship draws from this extensive experience with youth organizing, bilingual, public library service, and grassroots oral history work. His work has been recognized and utilized by politi politics and prose, Hola uh, Cultura Univision, the office of the DC mayor and various universities across the US. I've had the honor to meet and work with Manuel this year. So Manuel, buenas noches, buenas tardes. I give it to you. Buenas noches, feliz, di feliz mes de la negritud. Uh, I wanna thank all of you guys for being present at our wonderful um, and our wonderful panelists. Um, so um, Afro-Latino Now Conversaciones is a series of talks on Afro-Latinidad. And this is one that deals with migration and black erasure. Again, we wanna thank all the sponsors, La Casa de las Americas at La Guardia Community College, the Center for Latin American, Caribbean and Latino Studies at CUNY Graduate Center, the International Society uh, of Black Latinos, the DC Afro-Latino Caucus, the Reforma Afro-Latina Working Group, and 
uh, the Afro Latino Forum and the Café con Libros Bookstore. Muchísimas gracias. Le damos muchísimas gracias a todos. And now I get the pleasure to introduce uh, wonderful professors. Um, Keisha Coronali is a scholar of 20th century history of empire, migration, feminism, and Afro-diasporic activism in the Americas. Her book, Panama in Black, Afro-Caribbean Worldmaking in the 20th Century, published uh, by Duke University Press, centers the activism of Afro-Caribbean migrants and their descendants as they navigate practices of policy and policies of anti-Blackness, xenophobia, denationalization, and white supremacy in Panama, and in the United States. The book is inspired by familiar histories linking Panama, the Caribbean, and the United States. Her writing can also be found in public books, the Washington Post, um, Signs, Journal of Women and Culture and Society, and the, and the Caribbean Review of Gender Studies, the International Journals of Africana Studies, and the Global South. Dr. Milagro Dennis Rosario is an associate professor in the Department of Africana, Puerto Rican, and Latino Studies at Hunter College, CUNY. She is the director of Puerto Rican Latino Sequence. She was born and raised in Puerto Rico. She holds a PhD in Latin America and Caribbean history from Howard University, a master's in Africana Studies from Cornell University, and a bachelor's in art history from the University of Puerto Rico. Professor Dennis Rosario has published in the Journal of Pan-African Studies, Latino Studies, Central Journal, Hispanophilia and Memorias, among others. She has also served as a guest editor with the International Journal of Africana Studies and Memorias. Her book, Drop of Inclusivity, Racial Formation, and meaning in Puerto Rican society, 1898 through 1965, published by SUNY Press, examines the racial discourse in Puerto Rican society in the context of modernity and U.S. ruling. Dr. Moreno is the Reverend John A. O'Brien Associate Professor in the Department of Romance Languages and literature at the University of Notre Dame, where she teaches Latinx literature and culture. She is the author of Family Matters, Puerto Rican women authors on the island and in the mainland, and Crossing Waters, undocumented migration in the Hispanic foam Caribbean in Latinx literature and art, uh, published by the University of Texas Press. She has co-created the Digital Humanities Project, Listening to Puerto Rico, and the exhibit Art at the Service of the People, posters and books from the Puerto Rican's Division of Community Education. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Es un placer mío, un honor. Gracias. It's the honor for me to be uh, in the same uh, vicinity <laughs> as you all, uh, <laughs> professors. Uh, so gracias. Um, first, I wanted to ask, because I'm in my same journey, I'm in the journey of getting my PhD, and so um, it's always uh, difficult for new uh, scholars to, to, to get into this work, and I wanted to ask you guys about your motivation. What, what, what was that like? What was your journey like? Um, and so I just wanted to start from uh, Keisha. Well, how was, well, Manuel, what, what thank was you for, for that, you know, introduction and your excitement. Um, and it's all of you for, for coming on and, and listening and, and reading, right? It's like all that we dream about as, as writers. Um, my motivation for writing the book really stemmed from wanting to understand a bit of the complexity that I noticed within my own family. And that was having great grandparents who I saw felt that they had been affronted, that they had been dismissed by the Panamanian state, parents that had this deep sense of patriotism, um, and then a generation of mine that opted to migrate 
and thinking about how connecting all of us were these practices and these explicit policies rooted in anti-Blackness and xenophobia that no one really openly talked about, right? It was murmured, it was sort of inside conversations and wanting to actually trace that and think about how is this all connected? How can I understand both this sense of, uh, of having been dismissed, of having been excluded and a desire to also claim spaces like Panama and New York um, really got me through and thinking about that. So as you're going through your own journey, thinking about what um, question excites you about what connects the now to the past. I mean, it's a historian that's always on my mind was, was so pressing. So really thinking about that long history of what connected multiple generations of my own family to these national and imperial histories that I only had read as a kind of from the outside in and not really from the ground up, from those who experienced it. Dr. Moreno, do you? Yeah, uh, thank you also, uh, Manuel, for, for that introduction. And I'm really thankful to, to be here in such great company. I really admire the work uh, of Dr. Corinaldi and Dr. Denise Rosario. Um, so in terms of uh, this specific uh, project, uh, Crossing Waters, um, I think, I mean, there are several motivations that I that I had when I was writing it. But I mean, the first one, I think, has to do with trying to push back against the image of the Caribbean as a paradise. Um, mm -hmm. Having uh, been born and raised in Puerto Rico, I recall um, being exposed to, um, you know, seeing on the, uh, you know, front page of the newspapers constantly, you know, um, reports about the deaths, you know, of, of um, immigrants, you know, usually from the Dominican Republic or Haiti dying on their way to Puerto Rico or being intercepted, et cetera. And to me that just, I guess it get, kind of stayed in the back of my mind. And then once I was, you know, as a scholar later on, fast forward decades, right? And just realizing that, you know, there's, <laughs> I've been seeing or observing this migration crisis happening. Uh, I've been seeing the news of people dying, trying to make it to Puerto Rico. And there seems to be such silence, you know, in terms of the scholarship that, that has been produced. Um, well, that's what it seemed to me because when, when we're thinking about borders, um, we tend to think of the paradigm of the Mexico-US border, right? But in my mind, you know, I was thinking, well, the Caribbean is acting as a border and people are dying trying to cross these waters, right? So, so what do we do with that? And so there was that part of it, um, which also led me to wanna like center the Caribbean then in discussions about the border, um, which is something that I think needs to, um, um, deserves more attention. Uh, so I'm hoping that, that my book inspires other scholars, <laughs> younger scholars to, to continue in that direction. Um, and then thinking of water and the and the idea of the water as a border and a bridge, you know, that duality, but the same thing happening with Puerto Rico, it can be a border and a bridge. So all these ideas were in my mind and um, equally important, the fact that um, um, the need to center blackness also in these discussions of inter-Caribbean migration, because um, the majority of the people impacted, the majority of the people who have to risk their lives um, trying to survive um, happen to be people who are uh, racialized, racialized as Black or um, Afro-descendant. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we can talk about uh, undocumented migration without talking about Blackness and anti-Blackness, but that's something we can address later. Profe, Dennis, Dennis Rosario. I, I also want to thank for being part of this great conversation. Um, Afro-Latino Forum uh, is making a great, great work. Um, 
my 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 book is drawn from my dissertation when I was at Howard University, mm -hmm. and I put it on the side because I have another things to do, find a tenure track job or so and so. But finally, when I I get grounded in a department, I started to look at that material, and I I'm glad because uh, I grew up a little more intellectually. And it allowed me to pro to develop another perspective instead of focusing on a chronological topic on Puerto Rican modernization and yes, issues of race. I I twisted and and I in certain degree uh, discussed race, racism, racial prejudice in the context of Puerto Rican modernization. Uh, and I use as a as a beginning in the 1898, because I say, we cannot on the island continue saying that the Americans brought racism because that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, the island it has a racial hierarchy established by the, the Spanish. It was almost 500 years. So what I, I argue is that the Americans brought another layer to racism on the island and the all classes from the working class, elite, political class, they found a way to counterattack or to go along with whatever it was being told. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 I do it thematically, chronologically, and I also observe that there is a romanticization of the Puerto Rican national identity that is not different from what is going on in Latin America, that they are Hispanophilic, uh, exclusive, and it, it's a, in, in, it doesn't include people of African descent. But mm -hmm. instead of saying that Puerto Ricans, uh, they were silenced, they used their ways to navigate, uh, conceptualize how the system works to, to try to, to, to gain a position in society. So each one of the chapters, I have an example of individual, a he or a she, that they did something that probably could be extraordinary. And at the same time, it shows resilience because there are many things that was against them. It could be gender, it could be, the, of course, the race and their social class. Because if you live in the country area or if you live in the urban area, the experiences of racism is different from each one of them, are, are, are challenges. Uh, so I, I look in, into the lives of certain people. Uh, I, I have people who are well known in Puerto Rican history, others they are not. So I, I'm trying to contextualize them in the struggle of having been, for them to be proud of what they are or to, for them to, to say, we, we have a value, we contribute to this nation, even though everything is against them, right? They are saying, no, what I'm doing is contributing something if you don't want to acknowledge it. So uh, uh, to me, it was very challenging in the sense of, I didn't want to get emotional, but I did while I was doing that. But I, I, I feel that I, it needed to be done. And I, I hope that the people that bought the book, they understand what is that is going on. Puerto Rico is not different than Latin America. It's very similar, it's racial democracy. We call it grand familia, great Puerto Rican family, or we call whatever, but it's, it's excluding people of color, or they call black, they call Afro Puerto Rican. And there are a lot of things um, that they develop to precisely to uh, not give or acknowledge Afro descendants. Mm. And I, I, I think a lot when I was thinking about the both all the books, I was thinking about Haiti a lot, um, and I was thinking about how the recent migration um, through the U.S. borders and what has happened to to Haitians. Um, and I also thought about, you know, the, the canal, right? And and how the canal um, brought so many migrants, Caribbean migrants to, to you know, Central America. And I, I just wanted to 
hear you guys. Oh, and also too, I thought about Greece um, and the African immigrants coming through the waters. When you when you talk about archipelago and or the liquid border, um, I thought about you know those instances where like black bodies are 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 dying in the sea. And so I just wanted to you to talk a little bit about how did you develop you know not just not just your theory but like your approach to to migration what what how did you approach migration differently because i know each approach migration a, a little different but the same subject was you know anti blackness at certain points by um political elites or by um judicial um strategies in different in different countries um so can you just talk to us about your approach um and recent events um that has happened like i thought about jasmine quinn in puerto rico and how people were like, like denying uh her her puerto ricanness um so just yeah i mean i'll jump in because like mm -hmm. you referenced the panama canal a bit and i often say like part of um, what motivated me to write about the book was also trying to have people understand like what happens after right we are so used to thinking about especially black people being brought in to build right to construct and then sort of being left without citizenship being left without opportunities and we're seeing that right now in dominican republic with the denationalization of dominicans of haitian ancestry which has so many parallels to what I write about happening in Panama in the 1940s through the 60s that is directly targeting, right? Black people, Black folks as um, perpetual foreigners, perpetual outsiders, notwithstanding how many generations you might have in the country, notwithstanding that you are putting forth this idea that you should be able to speak multiple languages, that you should be able to have these connections that cross borders, there is this insistence in fixating on what has to be the true, you know, Panamanian, the true Dominican, right, the true Puerto Rican, and that um, my book outlines, and I think all of our books outline, ultimately end up further ostracizing, further excluding Black folks, right? We don't win when it comes to these narratives of having to prove yourself generation through generation, because what you learn is that citizenship is fickle. It can be taken away. Your belonging, your sense of, of being can consistently be questioned. And so what you have to do instead, and, and what I propose in the book, is create your own world, create your own idea of what it means to form part of a diaspora community, to form part of something that is both local, but grounded in an understanding that you are not alone in the world. And that message, you know, is so powerful in this. I was writing it and looking at how people were engaging in this in newspapers and organizations. I realized that they were doing this because there was an urgency that they saw, that they were seeing young people around them feeling that there was nowhere in the world where they could be. And that for me is, is what I fear is happening when we just see replete images of um, black folks dying, right? Over water, over land, the, the, the idea of, of black life, the idea of black possibility gets um, completely pushed aside. And so I, I want for us to think about how do we reckon with what is happening with also a history of how people have survived, how black people have had to find ways to navigate systems that were purposefully intended to exclude them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will, um, oh, you want to go, Mark? No, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, I was uh, thinking about different issues. Uh, in the case of Puerto Rico, I give an example uh, in, uh, in one of the first chapters. There was a proposal for by a member of one of of the government that I think he was a Spanish, actually one of those ones who stayed, that he proposed that uh, the new government, government meaning the, the Americans, they should export Puerto Ricans to South America, black Puerto Ricans. And uh, in reaction to that, one of the uh, labor leaders named Ramon Romero Rosa, who was very 
uh, outspoken. He wrote a letter titled, a, a letter to black Puerto Ricans. Uh, and he uh, make an account of the, of the history of Puerto Rico and how, how his slavery affected black Puerto Ricans. And he also say, how can we cannot allow that the new government, but people like this particular person he's talking have influenced essentially saying because Puerto Rico is our land. And we need, we don't need to be exported anywhere because we are Puerto Rican. Yes, well, technically that person is a Spanish, so he's not Puerto Rican, the one who made the proposal, but that is the, the environment that Puerto Ricans were seeing themselves at the turn of the century where some individuals were proposing to export them. And in exchange to bring white Americans to Puerto Rico. So it's an ex, ex, experiment like a, whitening like blanqueamiento but uh, you know it's and it, it doesn't make sense when you really look like that but uh, i think that in the case of the island too uh, puerto ricans found themselves in a political vacuum when americans arrived and everything that had to do with granting american citizenship to puerto rico that it was in 1917 was discussed based on race. It, uh, there's interesting discussions in the US Congress uh, where Luis Munoz Rivera, who was the commissioner resident, he, he was like basically saying, why are you waiting? We are hardworking people. We are moral people. We have uh, our religion. We are basically saying we are like you why you don't give us citizenship? Because we were in, in that limbo, essentially. And one of the congressmen say, because they were concerned that they, if they give American citizenship to Puerto Ricans, it's gonna become another Mississippi. And I, they don't want another Mississippi, meaning they don't want more black people. So that was like a, you know, a slap in his face to, uh, Munoz Rivera, he, he, he fought back, of course, but when he returned to the island, he, he, he changed the course in terms of how they're going to deal with, with the issue of American citizenship. So I think it was a couple of years later that it was granted, but he passed away and he didn't see it. Because it, again, it's just, we since the arrival of the Americans, the Puerto Ricans have been racialized. And it's a second layer of racialization because I'm, I'm a Spanish racialized Puerto Rican. So is and it, we we even have to talk about the perspective of a, a, a trauma because when you are not treated as equal and even in your own land because somebody came and they mm -hmm. underestimating your culture, your race, your background. You have to be on the look to defend yourself all the time. And that is very tiresome, exhausting. And if you are not that strong, you can give up and let that the situation just end your life. Some people could end your life, they end how they can end their life. Literally, sometimes they're gonna become alcoholic, drug addict, depression, all kinds of stuff because there is a situation that they don't have the tools to fight back. Um, so in, in my case, um, when I was thinking um, about my book, you know, my, my purpose was to look at how undocumented intra-Caribbean migration uh, so that's the movement between the islands uh, of the Hispanophone Caribbean. How has that been represented in, in literature and in art? So that was, um, you know, that was my, my main goal, right? And, and in looking at those works that have to do with contemporary undocumented migration, I started noticing how these works were really insisting on some of them, a good number of them, 
on connecting the past and the present. And when I'm talking about the past, I'm referring to the middle passage. You know, mm -hmm. I started seeing echoes, uh, evocations of the middle passage in works that are addressing contemporary uh, migration and the deaths that happen at sea. Um, so I was, it's really important, obviously, you know, when we're thinking of the Caribbean, we know that that's been a region that uh, for, for thousands of <laughs> years, right, uh, uh, was a very complex and fluid zone. I mean, indigenous peoples moved through that region. Um, they they had the, the technologies to do that. Uh, but then obviously things change, you know, with colonization. And then the Caribbean became this area where um, that has been characterized, that was characterized then by the violent uh, relocation or displacement of people. And I'm talking specifically about uh, enslaved African people brought to the Americas. Uh, so centering the, the Caribbean and looking at how um, these works are really playing, you know, with um, whether it's literature or or uh, visual art, you know, they're they're connecting that past and the present. Um, really, has been, you know, what inspired, you know, my my approach to this work and um, thinking of again, we need to to listen to that, you know, because I. I think first of all we don't yeah I don't I don't think as a as a society we pay enough attention to to undocumented migration and and not just yeah perhaps in the news you know it comes up but I I think there's more scholarly work that could be done in, in this area and when it comes to to the Caribbean, we're talking about a population, the majority, you know, obviously it's not exclusively, but the majority of the people who are trying to, um, to you know, survive, uh, arrive to Puerto Rico usually, you know, because Puerto Rico then functions as a stepping stone to the continental US. They are Afro-descendant people, you know, so there's just, it, it all connects with, that erasure of blackness with that you know i know we're probably going to get into a little um in a little bit so i don't want to say much about that right now but it's um yeah that was my angle <laughs> so it's slightly different you know from from um, the other you know from my colleagues here but yeah he, he, he and i also I, I think about a lot about ways the political elite um, use um, legislation to uh, combine the anti anti blackness and erasure, and also I think sometimes uh, uh, in Latin America we feel as though as Spanish enslaved masters were kinder to African peoples in the Americas, um, but. In terms of citizenship, there's been like it's been complex for Black folks to gain um, citizenship in their own countries that they that they were born, right? Um, so, for example, in Drop Drop of Inclusivity, um, Dennis La Profesora Dennis Rosario talks about um, Henry K. Curls, eighteen ninety nine report up on Puerto Rico and then and also the Jones Act uh, the Jones Act and it's just like different ways to, um that political elite try to negate black folks the, uh the presence the, the belonging in 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 Panama in black um Dr. Keisha, you talk about the acciones comunales, right? Like the the and you talk about al no, uh, al al como que se llama? <laughs> yeah, al norfo yeah. oh, but, yeah. but you also talked about like his his um tendencies to go to eugenics, right? Because and uh, it's another thing that we don't talk about too is like. Uh, the influence of the eugenics ideology and white supremacy in Latin America. 
So could you talk a little bit about, because I know in Panama, uh, Colón, right, um, that has a large population of Black people, Boca del Toro, but also in Puerto Rico, there's like, we know um, the, the most famous is Lorisa, right? And, 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 and how they um, created a community to protect themselves away from this mass oppression. Um, and so could you talk a little bit about, about uh, the struggles of citizenship for Black folks in Latin America? Yeah, I guess I'll start <laughs> again in terms of like I think we've gotten the flow going. Um, I wanted to make sure to touch on, you know, you dropped it and then kind of moved on about like that myth of the kinder Spanish masters and like just how extensive that myth has been, like that I hear people say that to this day. And that for me has so much to do with the anti-Blackness project, because you'd rather focus on this myth of a kind Spanish master than to actually address the Black people <laughs> that make your country what it is. And that really connects like colonial histories of elites fighting to figure out what do we do with all these Black folks who want political power, right? Who are fighting independence wars, who are saying we actually will be at the vanguard of making these movements, but at the back of their mind, they are deathly afraid, these white elites of ID, right? They do not want to see that happen. And so what you have instead is this overt attempt at taking away slowly but surely political power Right, by removing from political offices in the 19th century. And this, in the case of Juan Panama, still part of Colombia, the Liberal Party pretty much being pushed to the side. And that was a party that primarily had um, Afro descendants as their members. You have violence that's taken upon them in spaces like Olón um, to very much foment that. And that, I argue, really sets up the stage for racism that would then be targeted at Afro-Caribbean migrants coming from the Anglophone and Francophone Caribbean and uh, their descendants on the basis of always already being wary, being afraid of having a Black nation. I literally came across documents where people were like, we don't want Panama to become Jamaica, right? El peligro antillano en la América Central, right? You have all of these sort of um, clear and consistent signs of like, we don't want this to become that. And what I, I try to like emphasize in the book is that Panama is a Caribbean nation all along, right? They're fighting what is already happening. They're fighting the fact that it, it is a, a nation that already had the Cimarron communities that already now combined with the Afro-Caribbean descendant community were creating this rich, vibrant tapestry of what it was like to, to be able to resist. And for that reason, you needed legislation to try to divide and conquer Black folks. Mm -hmm. To say, actually, these Black folks are better than the other one. And that then sets up a pattern where creating unity, creating uh, collaborations becomes so much more difficult. And it takes time and it takes generations to challenge that. And to say, I see through this, I see that you're still harking on that myth of that kind master and not actually pointing out to us that when we're in the street, we are treated the same. No one cares what my particular ancestry is. And that, that is what we have to be fighting for and, and connecting to. So I very much see that long lineage of attempts at taking away political power from the colonial period all the way into the 20th century that has so much to do with this pervasive myth of, of creating the Spanish nation in the Americas and completely erasing indigenous presence, completely erasing Afro-descendant presence as a way to essentially channel um, this white nation that will never be, but that is very much seen in a seductive way. Mm -hmm. I would like to, to connect that. And actually uh, there's two points that I want to mention. I've been doing research about slavery because I'm writing a piece. And there's so much to say in terms of how uh, the plantation system work, how people have developed studies. I'm glad that there are studies 
that they are dismantling uh, this idea about the good master, whatever. Uh, they are focusing on, yes, their institutional focus on slavery, but there are also people who are using even literature to give voice and humanize people who were on the enslavement. The other, the other uh, point I wanna make is that in the case of Puerto Rico, as I mentioned earlier, the narrative of racial democracy is the grand familia Puerto Ricana, that we are all mixed and because we are mixed and everybody has the three uh, racial roots, Indian, African, and Spanish, we are all the same, so we are, we are not racist. And the problem is that we also compare constantly what they, with the United States. We cannot compare with the United States because the United States has a different system. However, in certain degrees, we have borrowed from the American system. And if there is no open segregation, why do you have people like in Loisa that it was just mentioned, there's so much uh, issues, economic issues there. Uh, there I have families from, from, from Loisa. And if you are from, one, from Loisa, it's very unlikely that you can marry somebody outside from there. That, that's a fact. In terms of, jobs and there are uh, studies coming now from, from about Loisa. And another example I want to make is about the attempts that the uh, Puerto Rican government made when they were accused by the League of Civil Rights and then the American Civil Rights uh, uh, organizations that they went and they investigate because they were not allowing Black Puerto Ricans to work in financial institutions. Mm -hmm. And they conducted a series of hearings and the Banco Popular, the Scotian Bank, the Chase Manhattan Bank, all of them, they, they have to, to, to declare it and give a, a, say, well, what happened is, and they started to blame Black people and say, because they are so-and-so and, -so, and that the transcript is very clear what they're saying. And after that, uh, more or less in that time, I'm talking about early 60s, the government of Puerto Rico requested to the US census to eliminate the question of race in the census. So that is a very blunt hand at them of erasing black Puerto Ricans because already everybody thinks that is, they are white and I'm not saying that they are not white, I'm saying that they are using their whiteness to, to as privilege and make it you know, take advantage. And then uh, for since 1960s to 19, 2000, the race question was not in the, in the Puerto Rican census. That is administered by the US, but the US allowed that to happen. The, the United, so we're talking about silencing of race. It was very obvious, very obvious. And when the census was allowed to, to, to have the question, what were the, the alternative? Or you are white, or you are black African-American, or you are Eskimo, or you are from so-and-so. So that is not what Puerto Ricans feel they are. And that's what the numbers say that 18, 20% are, are, they say they are black, but that definition of blackness is not the one that we are used to. It's Afro-Puerto Ricans, it's mulato, cafe con leche, trigueño, whatever. But well, that's the way we see uh, of ourselves. But it's, it's a uphill battle there. But I just gave an example of how the government can play a role in, in silencing race. So when I'm thinking of citizenship, um, I connected with the idea of othering, right? Uh, because I'm looking specifically at um, people without papers, you no, know, people without documents. Of course, they don't have access to citizenship, right? To the country where they are um, going to, the country that the society that receives them, right? Um, that said, uh, they may be citizens, let's say in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, in Cuba, right? Uh, but what I notice overall um, is that those who end up um, making that attempt to cross uh, 
the sea, you know, to make it again to Puerto Rico usually or somewhere else in the Caribbean uh, to eventually make it to the continental United States. They tend to be excluded from society before, during, and after. So we're talking again because we are talking about people who are uh, mostly Afro descendant. Um, mm -hmm. While they may, may technically be citizens citizens of their countries, um, that does not really mean that they are being treated as such. And so here, the the um, the concept of wasted humans uh, that Sigmund Bauman developed was really key in helping me um, think through all of this because he, he proposes that is a result of uh, modernization and globalization that certain humans, uh, and usually people of color, uh, Black people, then tend to be reduced by the global North into wasted humans, quote unquote. Like the, that, that means in the eyes of the global North, they are disposable. They are redundant, right? Um, so they cannot survive in their countries of origin. So they're looking for an alternative uh, and have to try, um, you know, surviving without documents. So that's that's part of that, right? Uh, but then what happens is that, you know, they tend to be racialized, they tend to be criminalized and all of that. So one perfect example that uh, Keisha brought up was the denationalization of, Dominicans of Asian descent in the Dominican Republic. Um, it's been, well, since 2013. So it, it'll be a year, uh, 10 years in September. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one of the, the most, you know, outstanding cases that we're seeing. But then I'm thinking also of, you know, all of the Dominicans and, and Haitians, for instance, who are, especially Dominicans, because there's such a big uh, number of Dominicans in Puerto Rico um, who have been there for decades and whether they are there with papers, with documents, because not all, all of them are there without documents, right? Um, whether they are there with documents or without, they are always seen as others and not, not seen as part of the Puerto Rican nation. And that of course has to do with anti-blackness because Puerto Rican society, I think we've made the point, is very anti-black and racist. And so that's part of that. But there's there's other factors that come into play, you know, classism, uh, you know, is complex, right? But um so yeah, even even the children of these immigrants who are born U.S. citizens, you know, in Puerto Rico, they are still not seen or understood or imagined as part of the Puerto Rican nation. And, and that's where it gets complicated. But, um, but we see resistance to that. And we see resistance to that through the arts, for instance. So it, uh... A couple of you guys touch on on mestizaje because mestizaje historical has historical significance in 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 terms of like its rootedness in white supremacy and like um, in the U.S. context how people um, have misconceptions of mestizaje uh, and for me los mestizos son blanco I have no es como the cut card que los mestizos son blancos tienen privilegios they have privileges that you know black folks do not have and so you, we we must whether whether you're mestizo or black or you know you have to know what privileges you have and I, and I guess white Latinos um, Latinidad in general uh, I always say has something uh, it, it has a reckoning coming uh, in terms of who they are or what it is that Latinidad is and um, how do we fit into those, into that? Do we want to be in it or do we want to be outside? But I wanted to have a conversation with you guys, a quick conversation because I 
they're timing me. And so um, we, we want the audience to have questions, but like, how does Mestizaje exclude, you know, Black, Black and, and, and or Africanness and indigeneity, uh, in particular, like examples that you have within your books? Because I know, um, uh, Professor Moreno, you, you talk about border border studies and how border studies only look at, you know, the Mexican, U.S. borders and, and leave out um, the Caribbean, the Hispanic form Caribbean. And so um, not looking at the Black folks. Mm -hmm. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about... Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think we, in the panel, we all agree. Um, you know, mestizaje uh, ex deeply connected with the concept of Latinidad, which in the end is white centric and is predicated upon black erasure. <laughs> uh, to touch on the topic of the panel, right? Uh, is predicated on that. And um, so many of the works that I'm I'm looking at in 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 the book. Um, again, whether it's literature or whether it's um, visual arts are challenging the whiteness that, um, that is associated with Latinidad. It's kind of pushing back against Latinidad uh, and saying, you know, we exist. These are our experiences, you know, uh, they deserve to be heard and seen and, and valued and honored, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I cover several authors, poets, etc. You know, the work of Mayra Santos Febres is very important. Uh, I have a section on her book of poetry, Boat People, which is all about undocumented migrants um, trying to make it to Puerto Rico. And yeah, so, um, but thinking more broadly too uh, you mentioned the the issue of the the border and and how latinidad you know in this country tends to be very mexican centric too um because the majority of latinos in the us are of mexican descent in in the end <laughs> uh, but then that that has erased um um the caribbean but 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 especially black Hispanophone Caribbean people. So I know we're short on time, so I'm just going to stop talking and let one of my colleagues go. Uh, I'll just add to that, um, that one of the things that is so insidious about mestizaje is that it attempts to seduce those that use it into thinking that it is an alternative to whiteness that you are somehow no longer bound by that white black paradigm because there are all these things in between. But if you look at who is heralded as the leaders, as the uh, persons to look up to, whether it is in Panama, Puerto Rico or you know, Dominican Republic, you very much have white individuals, right? And so this idea of we're talking about Misty Sahe, you're like, but you know, you're talking about whiteness, right? Is, is very much evident when you do that work. And what I loved about the groups and people that I talk about in the book, beginning with the newspaper, the Panama Tribune, and ending with the group Las Servidoras in Brooklyn, is that they both recognize the fallacy of Latinidad. They recognize the fallacy of a language-based, race-based assertion of who got to be Panamanian and who didn't, and instead created their own narratives of what it meant to belong in Panama and in New York. Mm -hmm. And so what I love about what they were doing is that they knew that they were in spaces where they were being told that it was only one language, one race, one notion of belonging, and that they challenged that by continuing to write in the languages that they wanted to, speaking in the languages that they wanted to, and asserting this idea that they were part of a broader community. And, and that for me is so fundamental when we're talking about Black erasure, because it does not um, actually work in the way that it is envisioned by these elites, right? You have black communities, we still have black communities that thrive and we have examples 
of people who did this work. And so I want for really the book to be viewed as a guide to how people have been navigating these questions, right? Black folks have been told repeatedly that we don't belong, that you shouldn't act a certain way, speak a certain way. Yet you have had to find ways to, to make a space for yourself and the generations to come. And when I look about, look at this newspaper started in the 20s, look at La Servidora as a group started in the 50s in New York, I think about the robustness of their ability to believe in this idea of Black belonging in a world that isn't predicated on citizenship, language, and the white supremacist notion of mestizaje. Mm -hmm. I would like just to add an example, even I know, I know I'm going to work that in, in another project I'm doing. I used the example of Andres Tirado, the father of Amica Tirado. Uh, he was sent to Tuskegee because he was on the, uh, because the U.S. gave this opportunity to Black Puerto Ricans to go there, but there were others that they were sent to Indian segregated school. So that's a process of, of indigenization, actually. And what about the, the beginning of, of, of the Southwest? Many of the Afro-Mexicans and Mexicans that they founded Los Angeles, the New, New Mexico, Arizona, they were Afro-Mexicans. And in the census, they started to use the word mestizo. So it was better to be mestizo than being Black Mexican. And that is the, the foundation of the Southwest in terms of, of that process of mestizaje and black erasure is right there. We should look more on that because it's, it's, it's amazing to see some of those uh, interesting uh, stories of people. I think that the last uh, governor of Los Angeles was uh, last name Pico. He was an Afro-Mexican, Afro mm -hmm. but in the, in the census, they put themselves mestizos. So they uplifted the race from being uh, racially mixed with African and mestizo became, is the, the new way to be white in those days. Mm. So because we're running on, on time and we want to start a conversation, uh, we are going to go to a Q and A. So if folks have questions, um, that they want us to answer, please let us know. Um, do you see any of, of them, Josue? Any questions? Not yet, but some are coming. So you can ask another one while people are asking questions. Um, so um, how do you stay current on topics of Afro-Latinidad? Could you name a resource, blog, podcast, book, or uh, organization you will recommend? So I would say Afro Resistance is, you know, um, New York-based, amazing. Um, the executive director is also Panamanian, so I'm slightly biased um, <laughs> about some of the work that, that they're doing, but it's a wonderful way of, of um, being connected. Um, so that's, that's one that I'll definitely say be on your radar. And if you are more into sound and or um, sort of reels on Instagram, Afro Latino Travel, which is like curated by Dash Harris, is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, as such, the radio station Negras that comes out of Universidad de Puerto Rico um, by the Colectivo that, Ile. Did I steal yours? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you steal. Yeah, I was going to mention uh, the podcast Negras, fabulous, yeah. uh, in Spanish, it is, so though. So I'm. I, it yeah. is, yeah. Um, but that, that's an amazing resource and, and for sure, you know, following Colectivo Ile, uh, the Black Latina Snow Collective, um, obviously the Afro Latino Forum. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These are some that come to mind. There's more though. Doctora, do you have, uh, Dennis Rosario, do you have any resources? blogs that you currently looked into to or journals that you might want to recommend oh it's uh, it's on mute oh 
No, I was I was mute. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I I also say negras. I there's another one. I don't remember the name, but, but it's coming from Spain, also oh, that okay. they they have a, a different. Uh, 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 they are publishing a lot of things going on in Spain, actually Afro mm. Spanish, and they are publishing in Spanish and in English, and there are things on also in Colombia. Uh, there are some websites in Colombia also that they they have. Um, in their publication and issues that are affecting their society. Hmm. So we have a question. Uh, how do you see the anti-Blackness playing out in modern Latinx politics here in the United States? Thank you for that question. Maybe we can talk about uh, uh, El, El Señor de, de Nueva York. Can you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. How do you see the anti-Blackness anti playing out in modern Latin A politics here in the United States? I, th I think about George, George Santos. <laughs> I think about um, the woke act in Miami and all that stuff, but- Yeah, but I, th I, th I think it's going more to, yeah very important but i think the question is more geared towards um anti-blackness among latinos right yeah i mean which uh, which is a reality <laughs> uh, and a few months ago uh, i'm forgetting all of the details this is this is not good um but in california but, you're talking about in california yeah there were some tapes were released uh, of a conversation of people making very, very racist remarks. Yeah, um, in LA, I think it was. Um, yes. I'm forgetting all the details, but it, it was just a reminder. I mean, mm -hmm. we are aware, we see it. <laughs> um, some people experience it deeply um, and it is something that obviously um, I am a white Latina. I have not experienced the type of, um, you know, racism, prejudice, violences, you know, that dark skinned Latinos uh, experience, but it is incredibly frustrating to um, just to know and to witness when this happens and realizing how, I, I think there's a lot of ignorance in terms of our own history, right? Um, our histories are not taught in school um, in the US. I mean, you know, if you're a Latino, you're not gonna learn too much Latinx history. So I think all of that, you know, it's um, plays a role in it, but, it's also something that's obviously that, that racism, that anti-blackness is something that's passed down from generation to generation. And, and we do have to break that cycle, but there's like no easy answers, right? It has to do with education, I think. And I would say like another important thing is for like white Latinas to know when to step out of the conversation, right? right? So often there is this centering of white Latinos and white Latinidad as though it is the only topic of conversation and you don't really get to talk about the ways that many you know are either within the U.S. replicating the very discrimination <laughs> that they would play out um, where they were born and where their families were born and then also in the U.S. context how there has been this attempt at sort of saying you have to, you can't align with African Americans, right? With other Black people from the Caribbean. That is all part of the ubiquity of, of how anti Blackness has worked in politics, so that you very rarely see a genuine discussion about all the connections that we share hemispherically um, in terms of Black folks coming together, having come together you know, for, for decades doing this work. And, and that I think is largely due to who 
ends up being elected to office under the emblem of being Latinas and Latinos. It's so free, infrequently um, are people who are of African ancestry, right? And, and if you are a Black Latina, like myself, sometimes you have people question like, oh, where do you learn Spanish from? And like, oh, it, it's, it's really a, a continuously annoying battle that I am often wondering, you know, how are we gonna actually have a genuine conversation if we still have all of these ways that we try to box out people, right? And the sort of darker you are, the more of this resistance you get along the way. So like all of that needs to be front and centered when it comes to thinking about who leads the discussions and the kinds of questions that need to be addressed. I agree with what you have said. In addition to that, it's just that if, if many immigrants, I'm not saying the one who were born here, but they learn a little bit, but they come from a society again that they are racialized. On TV, they watch these shows and there is, they are not represented there. They come here, they are not represented here either. And it's a way to say that everything that have this shade is cannot be cannot be, is out. So even in the census, as we saw in the recent census, I think it was almost 20 something percent, they wrote some other race. And mm -hmm. it's a way to say, I, it could be interpreted two ways, right? It could say, well, I want something else, or I simply, I prefer not to say it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to give you an example. I have my first day of class, a student of mine, when I spoke exactly about the census, he came and he confessed to me that he wrote in the census that he was white because he was not black either. And he's Indian. He can he can phenotypically he say, I know I am, you know, but I wrote that I white. So that there are many of them because there is not a, a space for them to claim that identity but at, while they have that struggle unconsciously sometimes they develop some kind of discrimination against afro latinos um to that effect uh there's a question here on how could schools and educators in latin america in the u.s do more to reverse the damage of anti-blackness uh, as they refer uh, to the Census reports from Puerto Rico and DR, where large majority um, check white only as their race and ethnicity. So how can we reverse the damages of anti-Blackness in our U.S. Latin American communities? Who wants to go first? I, I don't think it can. I, don't, I, I would like to be optimistic, but I am not. Because what mm. happened is that every day we are seeing many ways to exclude, to divide people and people for their sake, for they want to secure a place in society mm. or whatever, they gonna side to those one who represent power and those one who represent power, not necessarily are people of the same color, the same ethnicity. And unfortunately, uh, as my, Maricel say that is go passed down from generation to generation and it will require like a, a lot of, I don't know, bombarding everywhere since they were born to change the way that they could be exposed to, to anti-blackness. Because some of our students, they go to classes with, with African-Americans and they don't, they are not, um, friend of them, they are just the other, or some parents are very protective and they pick them on the school and they not allow them to, to, to you know, gather, be friends, or in other case they do. Um, so I, I because in, 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 even today in the United States, they are, they are attacking African-American studies. And that will be a way for, for children to learn how how is this the history of this society? And if they are taking that away from the curriculum, it's impossible for people to learn and be educated. 
I, yeah, I mean, I think the, oh. oh, go ahead, Marty said, yeah. No, go ahead, you start it. You know, I was going to say that the, I, I hear you totally, Milagros, on, on the education front, and especially what's happening with the attacks on African American studies and sort of AP credit, but just that the field as a whole. Um, I do think that like K to 12 education is this space where there is promise. And I partly come of it because I'm working on a, on a project with a colleague in Panama that we're thinking about how to um, better infuse into the curriculum questions pertaining to a kind of robust understanding of African ancestry in Panama, partly guided by some of the observations that were made following the census, right? Similarly, uh, like Puerto Rico, like the DR, the sense of, you know, we know that there is a large uh, Afro-descendant presence, that there is rich history, so how can we, how can we do that? Um, and part of it is by learning about a wide array of people who had, you know, different class standings, uh, different ethnic standings, uh, different skin color, like that how they too form part of um, black history in this context, right? And so really educating in them in that way. And I myself, and this was in the New York City context, what I loved being able to do was I participated in any age seminar for K to 12 teachers. And one of the things that they're encouraged to do is to think about how they can use life stories and primary sources within the classroom. And one of the things that I was um, encouraging them to do was to look at people like Robert Beecher, who had written recently an article about like um, back a couple of years back and who I mentioned briefly in the book, who was someone trying to do that very bridge building that sort of Milagros was talking about, like some of our students don't see this connection. He, because, and, and this is, has been a, a path that Panamanians in particular have just really set out for Black Panamanians, like creating these bridges um, whereby you really connect African-American, Afro-descendant experiences because um, for so many, they had experiences with U.S. style discrimination and Latin American style discrimination, right? Whether it was Jim Crow or it was this, I no existe racismo, but you are not allowed in this space. Mm -hmm. So that idea of, of there have been people who've done this, we need to put that before people's eyes so that they know it is not a new battle that they're facing, that there have been people who have been doing this work and that they succeeded, right? And thinking about the curricula that form part of schools and, and how we ended up with Black Studies, how we ended up with so many of these things was directly rooted mm -hmm. from communities who really recognized that if they were not going to demand that that work be centered, it wasn't going to be. So I, I, I see the resistance, but I also see that, that that resistance has happened before and that there have been, um, ways to push forward. Sometimes it's not as expansive as it could have been, but, but I see the promise there of doing that work. So the only thing I would add um, is that if, you know, it's not easy, right? Uh, Anti-Blackness, again, it's, it's global. It's mm -hmm. been going on for centuries. It's it's not something that's going to be solved from one day to the next. But I do think that um, we can do a little bit here and there, right, in our own lives to, to work towards some progress. And that, that means, I think, being very intentional about the, the literature we consume, the, that, that we engage with. Um, cultural products, art, uh, everything, right? Just being very intentional about, about that. If, if we teach, if we're in a classroom, whether it's a K through 12 or university level, make sure to include, you know, Black Latinx authors and not just one, you know, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> several, right? Um, artists and critics in your syllabi. I mean, whether you have kids or not, you know, there must be some kids in your life and it's not just purchase books, children's books. There's so many wonderful children's books now available written by Afro-Latinos about Afro-Latino uh, characters or historical figures. So just purchase them and, and, and give them to schools, donate them, right? Just let's just make this literature, all of this knowledge 
more available. And I am a big proponent of art really helping change minds and creating empathy. So that's where I'm, that's what I'm counting on, right? Um, so that's my two cents. He, uh, there's so many wonderful questions on the chat, but we have one last one, and then I will. I'm going to kick it off to Jose. Okay. Um, what are the paths forward? What tools are available for counting Afro Latino erasure, and or what is the status of local counter movements? Anyone? So what are the paths forward and what tools are available for countering Afro-Latino erasure? I mean, I think we kind of partly um, answer some of that. Like in my answer, you know, countering Afro-Latino erasure, um, purchase books, read, uh, Keep learning, right? We never stop learning. So keep reading, uh, look for this information, right? Um, but then when it comes to, you know, there's other ways that Afro-Latino populations are being erased, like through the census, you know, uh, as Milagros has been telling us. So, so there are um, um, campaigns, right? Like Colectivo Ile, um, that has done such an amazing job in Puerto Rico, right? Um, creating consciousness and, and educating people so that they actually mark uh, either black or Afro descendiente, right? And, uh, and so that then that's reflected because we do know that, you know, if we wanna, if a community wants to count, <laughs> you need to have the numbers, right? So, so there's a lot of work and, and it's encouraging because there's a lot that's been that's happening, but I think more needs to be done. I think that one interesting group also that they are doing an excellent job in terms of working for their community and even in getting involved in the government to to make sure that they their identity is there at the Garifunas, and yeah. they they are the one who uh, make a deal with the administration of the Blasio in the census of 2010, I believe, to educate people of writing, in their case, to write that they are Garifunas, but also to tell us that we can write that we are Afro-Latino, so we are Afro-Puerto Rican, Afro-Dominicans, and, and, and to read history. I think that's important that we have to read our history. There are new historians there that they are revisiting and giving voice to, to Afro-descendants in the history of the country. Uh, our country, so I think that's very important too. I would just add to that, like finding more spaces like this one where people are able to, to access it, you know, access the information, you know, for free in a way that really gets them to, to hear a little bit more about it. So I've been really adamant about trying to make connections when I can with libraries, right, with, with podcasts, with whenever uh, it's possible to sort of like get that conversation going, because I think that's also where we're getting a nice combination of a younger generation and an older generation that kind of likes to, to participate in both kind of radio-like, but also podcast-like conversations. So I think we, we have to be adamant about being public. Um, I think one of the things that is a danger for anti-Blackness continues to be perpetuated is when we allow those that are communicating this message to dominate public intellectualism, where they are the ones who are going um, to these public spaces and denigrating and talking against the group. So I want for us to find more spaces where we are showing up and we're actually mapping out those histories, mapping out the possibilities so that it isn't just a kind of uh, reaction to it, but rather us curating the narrative of what it means to truly embrace uh, uh, an idea of black life in the Americas that encompasses Afro-Latinx, Afro-Latine, African-American, Afro-Caribbean, uh, Garifuna identities as a whole. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos por 
estar aquí con nosotros hasta las ocho y media. So thank you for being here until this late. Um, Josue, you, do you want to keep, you want to finalize the, the talk? Y gracias a ti. Yes, no, uh, I know that we have very uh, limited uh, interactions with everyone. We're sorry about that. We had actually to be, estamos en familia, some security concerns because of anti-blackness, because of this conversation that we had to do that. So I just want to shout out all of our speakers, Dr. Keisha Corinialdi otra vez, Dr. Milagros Denis Rosario, Dr. Maricel Moreno, and of course, our very own Manuel Mendez, Manuel is uh, an incredible collaborator and, and I'm so glad. And when we had an initial conversation for the event, Manuel was like, I'm down. This is a good conversation. I had to twist his arm to get to do it, but I'm down. And I'm really excited about that. I also want to shout out, uh, she had to leave, um, but Kalima de Sus is the owner of Cafe Con Libros. Cafe Con Libros is a, a not for Latinx bookstore. Uh, here in Brooklyn, New York. And that's another resource that you can use, supporting Afro-Latinx bookstores, supporting people who do the work. Uh, Keisha's first conversation was with uh, Café Con Libros on her book. And so I just think supporting Café Con Libros would be a really good resource. Uh, I always love to shout them out. They were they, they were a co-sponsor for this event, but they also are curating a book list. So we have a few things coming up with the forum and with other organizations. Um, Café Con Libros is starting to curate a book list for children and for adults on Afro Latinidad. And, and I know that we're working on something similar like that at the Afro Latino, Afro Latino Forum where we're trying to uh, update that and you will see more information on that soon. Before we go, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we have a, a, a very important campaign that we wanted to share information on. Um, uh, we uh, are part of, uh, just as we were talking about anti-Blackness in these conversations, we are a part of a, of a national campaign called Latinos slash Hispanic is not a race. Uh, currently, there's a current proposal by federal agencies, by the OMB, uh, the Office of Management and Budget, which controls the way that data is collected in this country to consider Latinos, Hispanics as a race and not as an ethnicity. And so therefore, those of us who uh, consider ourselves and believe ourselves and know ourselves to be Afro Latinos, Black Latinos would not be able to to check that out. So we wanted to promote this right now to make sure that you stay on, on top of it and help us. This is an actual way of combating anti-Blackness. Someone said, "What is the path forward?" Will help us in this cause. And so go to Latino is not a race that info or Hispanic is not a race that info. All one word. Latino is not a race that info. Hispanic is not a race that info. There you will see how you can take action on making sure that you leave a comment for the Office of, of Management and Budget and how this would be detrimental to the counting of Afro Latinos and of Black Latinos overall and, and Indigenous Latinos as well. There are other Latino populations that are affected. We are the largest population that would be affected, but there are many other populations that would be affected. And so we wanted to make sure that you knew about this uh, national coalition. We were very excited. We have Afro Resistance is part of it, Afro Latinx Travels, Encuentro Diaspora Afro from Boston, International Society of Black Latinos, uh, DC Afro Latino Caucus, um, uh, the Puentes Collective, uh, the Black Latinas No Collective. We really have a, a we, today, just even we got some partners from Museum Hue, which is a museum that focuses on people of African descent. And so we are trying to get the word out there about this initiative, about this campaign, so that we are able to combat the proposal to hide race and to literally erase our population from being counted. This is dire implications on human rights resources and social justice tracking. We will be having an event with that campaign on March 9th. Uh, called Why Does Counting Afro Latinos Matter? And so, because people sometimes are like, why does that matter? Well, it's really important. And so you're going to get more information on that after this event. And so just wanted to make sure that this was one way in which we're combating Black erasure literally at the current moment, literally right now, is something that we have to do. And what you can do is go to Latino is not a raise that info or Hispanic is not a raise that info and just read what you need to do. There's an action button there that says what you can do. And you click it and it shows you right there what you need to do in order to help us out with that. But with that being said, I wanted to thank everyone 
for coming. Thank you so much for being a part of this wonderful event. Thank you again to our speakers, Keisha Corinaldi, Maricel Moreno, Milagros, and Rosario Manuel Mendez. Thank you to Yahusef Medina. Thank you to Ryan Man Hamilton and the entire team who made this happen. Kalima de Sus, Juanita, uh, Juanita Palacio Sims, and all of the people that made this happen. Uh, uh, of course, DCF for Latino Caucus, Cafe Con Libros, Casa de las Americas, ISBL, uh, the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, Latino Studies, at CUNY Graduate Center, the Reforma Afro-Latina Working Group, and of course, the people at the Afro-Latina, Afro-Latinx Forum. Thank you so much for your time. We hope that you had a great conversation. This recording will become available and we will send some follow-ups. And to those who have some questions, we're sorry we couldn't get to them, but we are thankful for your excitement and engagement. Please purchase the books at either Cafe Con Libros or you, in the email, we'll also have some codes from the book, from the authors themselves that you can use to purchase so that they get the credit that you purchased the book from their, from their, uh, from their link. So thank you again all so much. May you have a, a great evening and I'll, we'll send you more information on our next event on March 9th. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.